When it comes to films from outside of Hollywood, it almost seems like some of the most unappreciated come out of Brazilian cinema, which has been on the rise in recent years. A talented group of filmmakers have come forth with interesting and unique visions of their home country. If you're looking to explore Latin American cinema and the best films it has to offer, the work of the likes of José Padilla, Cajun Burger, and Fernando Morelos are good places to start. Where the current state of Brazilian cinema began its strong ascension depends on one's point of view, but I think Walter Salas deserves partial credit. Central Station found itself getting widespread international attention, and for good reason. Establishing his penchant for road trips, Salas keeps the film focused on the relationship between a young boy searching for his father and a retired teacher helping him on his journey. It's a strained friendship, but it works with a smart script developing the two. Fernanda Montenegro, one of the most renowned Brazilian actresses, gives an excellent performance in the leading role, working really well alongside the young actor. Salas does not shy away from the tough situations they encounter on this journey, but occasionally sprinkles in subtle moments of humor. If you want to find a film to start watching Brazilian cinema, Central Station is a good place to begin. Another great Salas film is Behind the Sun, which went for an historical backdrop in the lengthy feud that has erupted between two families. There's a strong mood evoked and a genuine tension as neither side knows when one of their family members will be killed. At the center of the story is the son of the poorer family and the difficult decisions that come with taking part in a pact he wants little part in. The circus performers that come seemingly represent a better future for the sons, and the romance between Tonyo and Clara is rather sweet. This is not a feel-good film, though, as it questions the role of violence in society and the constant thirst for revenge people have. It's absolutely worth seeking out. Even before Walter Salas, there was Bruno Barreto, who pushed for more commercial cinema in Brazil. A filmmaker who jumps between Hollywood and Brazilian films, he combined the two sides of his filmmaking background for four days in September. Inspired by the actual event when the American ambassador to Brazil was kidnapped by a student guerrilla group opposed to the military government of the time, the film is gripping and exciting as it deals with both the group's plan and the eventual kidnapping. Barreto does not romanticize them, but the group is not portrayed as villains even if their actions are ultimately wrong. Alan Arkin, playing the ambassador, is great, showing somebody trying to remain calm in this scary situation and trying to rationalize with these students. The film mainly works as a time capsule to a different time in the country's history, as well as showing a different international perspective on it. Barreto paces the story incredibly well, keeping it necessarily suspenseful, and even if you're not familiar with the true story or when Brazil was under a dictatorship, it's easy to get engaged in the events. Barreto would also direct Light Affair as with Bossa Nova, a charming romantic comedy romp that paints a postcard image of Rio de Janeiro as both a tourist destination and a metropolitan with working people. The script is consistently funny, and like Four Days in September, Barreto portrays both the local and international perspective of the city. All the ensemble works very well, including Amy Irving in the lead role. Some parts of the plot can be a little ridiculous, and I find it a little hard to believe that every apartment window has a view of Sugarloaf Mountain. But the film nonetheless works as a fun and breezy escapade. Giuseppe Padilla is a director who has become rather infamous for rocking the establishment, but I'm not talking about the film industry. With both of his Elite Squad films, Padilla dug deep into the brutal police forces that frequently and violently infiltrate the slums of Rio de Janeiro. The first Elite Squad is unflinching in how the head captain of the squad tackles his job and assigns the new recruits. However, the script also delves into the bribery that occurs between the drug lords and the police officers. There's almost a documentary feel to the way Padilla digs his camera into the various settings, including the police station, the apartments where the police reside, a local university, and the favelas. The Elite Squad has been criticized for glorifying police violence, but I think it does the opposite, as it shows the inhumane way some members of the force go about their business. Elite Squad 2, The Enemy Within, took things to an even higher level by tackling political corruption as well, a frequent problem in the Brazilian government. The action is even more fine-tuned and thrilling, while again, not shying away from the brutality of it. José Padilla later went on to direct the recent remake of Robocop, where he sadly had little creative control and was mostly a director for hire. However, watching both Elite Squad films, one can see he would have made an amazing Robocop movie if he had been given the freedom to. 
just last year saw the release of Anna Malat's The Second Mother, which delved into the role of the housemaid in middle to higher class families. Regina Kasse plays the lead role, showing both comedy and pathos, as she deals with her daughter Jessica temporarily staying with her, and the events then sue as the divide between the two parts of society. Every character goes through interesting changes upon the arrival of Jessica, and Millette's screenplay develops them quite well. However, what works the most is how she explores the portrayal of the typical Brazilian home. You may notice a lot of the films I've talked about in this video are related to the slums and the poor people of Brazil, mainly because these are the ones that find the biggest distribution outside of the country. Hence, the second mother becomes rather unique in how it looks at your average Sao Paulo family, and so that this film got such a quick release to English-speaking territories is quite the pleasant surprise. Sadly, this film was passed over for an Oscar nomination for Best Foreign Language Film this year, not even making the shortlist, thus continuing the foreign film branch's weird aversion to strong Brazilian films since 1999. Of course, it's difficult to discuss modern Brazilian cinema and not bring up City of God. Fernando Morales took a clear Martin Scorsese influence when directing this fast-paced crime film about life in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. He, along with co-director Katia Lund, take you headfirst into the lives of the young criminals and through the eyes of the aspiring photographer trying to survive. The way the film plays with time is impressively done, and there's not a single dull scene as Morales plays around with traditional film techniques. The violence is harsh and brutal, but fitting the setting as Morales tried to go for an authenticity right down to hiring young people living in the slums to portray the characters. The soundtrack is incredible, feeling like hearing the records they probably listened to at the time. The editing also deserves commending of how it knows when to speed up or slow down the footage at the right moments in order to get the proper emotional reaction from the audience. All the pieces come together to create this entertaining and rather stark depiction of this underworld. The films I've talked about today are Brazilian films directed by local filmmakers. However, with Trash, we have a Brazilian film directed by a British filmmaker. Stephen Daltrey, the director of Billy Elliot, did a pretty good job of capturing the lives of young children living in the slums in a captivating tale with an inventive use of flashbacks. The young actors chosen for the parts all do a very good job in their roles. Some of the highlights include when we see the children using the little shortcuts and hidden areas of the city, to evade the corrupt police going after them, leading to some very exciting foot races. The appearances of Rooney Mara and Martin Sheen as American social workers teaching the children how to speak English aren't distracting and both also give commendable performances. Daldry keeps the plot moving, and this is definitely a film I'll revisit every once in a while. It's a shame this got so little attention, even though I personally liked it more than the somewhat similar Slumdog Millionaire, which also had a British director tackling the subject of slum children on foreign soil. I hope these titles interested you to seek these out, and if you have some favorite Brazilian films I did not get around to discussing yet, be sure to include them in the comments. I would like to hear about them and give them a look. And be sure to tune in next week, in which I will talk about the work of a particularly underrated Brazilian director, Calvin Burger. See you next time.